On part two of two, we chat with Paul and Yuan Rat Waddell about their book, Radical Thought, Thai Mind. So if you're interested in learning about Thailand's political boundary pushers, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee crap, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 for a few months of sun and fun, but ended up staying for the aircon and work. You can't beat the aircon, man. Cannot. The work? Yeah. 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 Take it yeah. or leave it. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 22 years ago, fell in love with coming up with euphemisms for military control of the government, so I never left. <laughs> it's like a parent taking care of their child, you know? Like, that's uh, Actually, that's not bad. That's, that's actually a pretty bad. good one. Like no, a honestly. Mama I, bird protecting her eggs, you know? I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. No, you know, I, 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 I literally teach political science, and I, I sometimes have trouble describing, like, the Thai system of government. Like, I don't the, the best I can have come up with is, and this is more formal, it's, it's, it's a military-managed semi-democracy. That's like the best. <laughs> like, that's the best thing I've got. But you know, maybe you know, maybe maybe a, a mama bird looking after eggs. Maybe I should go in that direction. Right, right. Just got to pick the right mama bird. You know, I watch. I saw a video. I mean, this, again, we're getting off on a tangent right away. But I saw a video the other day of man. I can't remember what type of bird it is, but it's a pelican or something. But say they the, the mom lays four eggs, and it's like, well, I only gonna get enough food for three babies, so it pushes one of the babies out of the nest. Oh, jeez. It was. It's a brutal video. It just like gets totally, its back yeah. into it and just backs up until the bird falls out of the nest. Like, see ya. That's rough. That's Nature's rough. Nature's rough, man. That reminds me of uh, when I when I talk about evolution in my social science class. There's what is the I can never remember the poet. The, there's uh, a famous poem uh, uh, that goes like, "Nature is red in tooth and claw." Whatever that is. So I'm sure our listeners can Ooh. Google it. Nature is red in tooth and claw, and it just it's about stuff like this. It's just about how if you actually pay attention to the natural world, like animals do like horrible things. Yeah. Like just horrible. Like I think I think I think male bears I think they kill babies, kill their own babies so the 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 female bear will have sex with them again or something horrible. Like it's just they eat they eat their own children or something. Like it's, Damn. Just, it's just That's a nightmare. Mama bears are so protective. Anyway, if you're not a patron yet, these are the kind of tangents that Ed and I get off on on our That's bonus right. shows. So Yeah, I'm not sure what this has to do with Bangkok, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is what it is. You it get is you is. you get what you get when you sign up for the Bangkok podcast. <laughs> all right, we want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get Every episode a day early, behind-the-scenes photos of our interviews, a heads-up to send questions to upcoming guests, and access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. On this week's bonus show, we chatted about Greg's possible eye surgery to fix his crappy vision, that's a scientific term, and how he'll navigate Bangkok if things go wrong, a ruling in Bali that bans tourists from renting motorbikes, and if that would ever work on some of the dangerous roads on Thailand's islands, and what the appearance of a free condom machine at my university says about Thai culture and the willingness to crank that knob and get a free condom in a public area. Nice. Nice. Crank that knob? Did you did you, did you have to word it that way? <laughs> well, that's how you get the condom. You turn the knob. <laughs> to learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. Right. And as always, if you have a comment, a show idea, or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we'll play on the show. All right. And this episode is part two with Paul and Yuang Rat Waddell who are very well known in Thailand's business, journalism, and scholarly circles due to their work in those areas. Yuang Rat is a professor of political science and author of numerous articles on Thai politics 
and Paul, a former journalist who served as president and executive director of the Keenan Institute Asia, they wrote a book called Radical Thought, Thai Mind, A History of Revolutionary Ideology in a Traditional Society. Now, being history and politics nerds, Ed and I both found this topic very fascinating because you can really learn a lot about a culture by studying the people, incidents, and thinking that gives rise to some of the fringe and radical parts of it, not to mention how successful or unsuccessful those ideas may be. So Paul and Young Rat were kind enough to welcome us to their lovely house where we had a very enjoyable and incredibly interesting conversation about this and many other related ideas. So here is part two of our conversation with Paul and Young Rat Waddell. Well, let's come back to the to the 1932 revolution then. And one, one of the things that I found really fascinating in your book that I didn't know was that uh, Preeti Banamyong and Plek Big Boon Songkram, who are people that are very, very important in the evolution of Thailand in the 20th century, um, I didn't know that they were classmates or friends and they were so close, but they eventually had a bit of a split. And I think that really influenced how Thailand's politics and radical thinking developed over the 20th century, because Pretty represented the more democratic socialist side of things, where Plek Pibun Songkram uh, sort of was influenced by the old Sakdina system, the order, the structure. Um, he was also a military guy too, which helped that too. So can you talk a little bit about how those two guys represented those two factions of thinking? Yeah, well, they knew each other because they were both members of the Overseas Thai Students Association. Right. In France. Yeah, but Pibun Songkram uh, spent most of his time in Europe in Germany. And, Italy school, yeah. Uh, Bridi, most of his time in France. So that was the beginning of the difference. But the real difference was that uh, Bridi went into education, founded Tamasat University, while uh, Pibun Songkram was a military officer who rose fairly quickly uh, through the ranks. Although in the early days, their objective was the same, to overthrow the absolute monarchy. Not the monarchy, but the absolute monarchy. Mm. There was a great deal of frustration among the well-educated non-royal ties that less competent people were above them because they were members of the royal family. Maybe not top members, but or they had connections. They had yeah. connections. They had family connections. And of course, because King Chulo Longkorn uh, and his father had so many children, that people, sure. there were a lot of people with royal connections. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. The young graduate from, you know, military school in Europe. Right. And become the head of the army, something like that. Yeah. So, so Plak Pibun Songkram, he really began... The, w w with his coup, with his initial coup, which what, what I think was 1937, 1938, he starts the, the military's role in, in the post-absolute monarchy period. That's right. But the core of his influence came in 1933 when... Um, well, the counter-revolution, correct. He was the principal commander who defeated the counter-revolution. Uh, using artillery oh. in right. an innovative way, stuff that he'd learned in in Germany. Was this the, the, the sort of civil war between the Navy and the Army? No, no, no. no. no that's this later. is long that's before later. that. This right. is the counter-revolution. So, but this is fascinating because I would say that the, the so, so that's, so in, in that case, he's still on the side of democracy, but then that's going to change within five years or so, four or five years. That's right. I, I think the first step was uh, that he was neutral in the effort to ban Bridi and quash his economic plan, yeah. which was socialist in Very orientation, socialist. probably naive, and probably sure. was a good thing that it didn't go through. You, right. you had a quote there from Bridi about, about his experience. Can yeah. you read that out? Yeah. Um, he had proposed uh, an idealistic economic plan that basically made every Thai a civil servant. Mm -hmm. And he also allowed the conservatives to have a strong voice in the government mm -hmm. uh, that he was part of. And later he recognized that he'd been a bit foolish. He said, when I had power, I had no experience. And when I had more experience, I had no power. <laughs> right. So what, what interests me in my research was that his economic plan was uh, counter-attacked by the king. And I 
realize the king knows Thailand better than Pridi. Mm. Because Pridi assumed that everyone wants to be the civil servant, right? Right, he's a bit naive. Work in the office and all that, and he wants to make farmers, civil servants. And the king counter attack that. No, you're wrong. People want to be in the office. The farmer doesn't want to be in the office. In the office, you have to work like every day, you know, early holidays, Saturday and Sunday. But being a farmer, you have a rich land. You can rest six months doing nothing. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. right? <laughs> have freedom. So the king is very. I mean, I just discovered from my research the Thai king, in fact, a very brilliant. He really knows what's going on. Who really no no Thai minds, but this. Pretty, he's just very idealistic. Yeah. His plan want want to divide the land. No ownership. Who wants no, no ownership at all? Everyone becomes you know the property of the state. <laughs> yeah. Control the economy like socialism. You know, very radical socialism. Yeah. And the king is not like that. That's one thing I thought that your book did a really really great job with was this particular story, and it made me start to think about what if. You know, I like these alternate histories. What if the Nazis had won World War II? You know, what if Native American culture had thrived and, and won over the colonialists in North America? And is, you know, reading this book, what if you know what happened in our history in our <laughs> in our universe is that Breedy eventually was uh, exiled. I think he died in France, um, yeah. and then. Black like people and Song Kram eventually became prime minister, and then I think we've sort of followed after that. But my thought was, what if? What if Pretty was not Pretty banished? Faction had what if succeeded? the Pretty Faction had won? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. great things. Since he's the founder of my university, then great things would have happened <laughs> <laughs> if the Pretty Faction would have succeeded. Pretty's, but he's not a communist, by the way. No. A lot of people, a lot of many people afterwards, uh, brand him as communist, and his wife Kun Jing, his wife really sue those people and she won every single case. Really? Hmm. Oh, wow. But he's not communist. But I think that that's another one of the ways that the civilian faction of uh, Kanat Rat was defeated was by the use of the fear of communism. Oh, sure. And uh, that has carried through until recently when communism has kind of lost its yeah, fear right, factor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, so, right. so can you talk then about how the conservatives sort of became the dominating force then back after Plague Bibun Song Kram, um, how conservatism sort of began to have a greater influence in the direction of, of Thai culture and Thai society? This probably will be our next nonfiction book. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I had a look at... Uh, Uh, conservative thought, Thai mind. Uh, but uh, basically, it was the real politic of military power. And that uh, one of the big mistakes that Breedy made was not to create a political party that could reach out and get support in the countryside. In fact, the Constitution banned political parties. Oh. And they were grouping. So the only organized political machine in the country was the military. And they ran it like a machine and continue right. to do so. Sure. Interesting. Okay. The other thing that fascinated me when I read uh, a couple history books, uh, Chris Baker's book and stuff, um, is the role that the United States played in supporting the Thai, Thai military in the Cold War. Uh, and, it, you know, because when I, when I first read about the Thai protests in the 70s, Part of those protests was anti-American, and I know. And at first, I'm like, "Why? These are young protesters fighting for democracy. Like, why are they anti-American?" And it's because they they knew how much money the U.S. had given to the the, the Thai Literally. generals, the Thai generals. Yeah. That brings me to the question you said: Why the uh, democracy dies down in Thailand? Because when we have a civilian government, politicians are very corrupt. They were corrupt. No disciplinary, nothing, and the Thai people realize that, oh, they are being being exploited, so they prefer the military. Yeah, I've they think, this. yeah. So that that how how the Thai politicians are even viewed, though are the, probably at. the most corrupt person in Thai history the was civilian, uh, Thaksin, General Sarit. Sarit, the uh -huh. most corrupt. <laughs> But at the same time, he got a lot. It's 1957. He got a lot of fun from America sure. to develop the country in the countryside in his own town in the northeast, which at that time was very poor, the poorest part of Thailand. He got a lot of fun, donation, a lot of fun from America. And when you did that, people sort of closed their eyes to this personal, you know, 
property. Sure. He, they didn't care whether he, he could. Yeah. He delivered the goods. Yeah. Well, he's corrupt, yeah. but I got a new farm. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and that idea, by the way, still remains till now. I talked to the taxi drivers during taxing period. He brought in the rice project, right? Mm. You, you buy all the rice from the farmers and try to stabilize the price to be good. And I know this is against the economic you know, theory. You could not you know, fight against the, the, uh, the market. The, the market. Sure. So I asked the taxi driver, every single one, he said, do you think most of them are the rice farmers coming sure, to, yeah. to dry right. in the dry season? Do you think it's good? He said, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Taxing gonna corrupt or get a lot of money. I have my rice. I have my my share. I, you know, I can sell my rice at higher price. That's all I count. Right. That's exactly the idea that he was still here in Thai society, which is the Thai is being accused of being very selfish. Think about your own your own benefit rather than the. National. Well, I don't think that's the Thai thing either. That's that's yeah. what we've talked Everyone. about that on the podcast. The thing about corruption, right, is that the maddening thing about it is when it works in your favor, it's great. <laughs> exactly. Right? Right. Everyone like, thinks it's great. You when can, it you can say, "Oh man, the problem here is a corruption, corruption," and then you can get out of a parking ticket for a hundred baht. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sign me up. And in <laughs> right, fact, there right. was a uh, research conduct, you know, at the at Samson University. I used to teach there, and the students they asked this future businessman, and a thousand students, "What do you think?" about the corruption in Thailand. 90, more than 90% of them saying that, I don't care as long as I have my piece of cake. Hmm. This right. is 98% right. of the future businessmen in Thailand, Essential University Business School. Really? Right? So. I, years ago, I interviewed um, uh, the Irish consul uh, here for Big Chili Magazine back when I was writing for Colin and oh. his, his, his outfit. <laughs> and uh, we talked about corruption in Thailand and, and and I said, what do you think about it? Corruption in Thailand? And he's like, oh, I love it. He goes, <laughs> he goes, every place is corrupt. Every place in the world is corrupt. But in Thailand, at least they smile at you when they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because, because it has become the Thai culture. It's integrated mm-hmm. because of mm-hmm. Sakrina system. It mixed very well. That's right. Let me follow up on that a little bit. Um, one of the attributes of Saktina culture was that power was devolved to the heads of the various uh, city-states. And uh, there was a system called Chao Kin Mung, which mm. meant that they were paid no salary. They, they compensated themselves by what they could get out of the area that they controlled. And that thinking continues that, um, you know, your salary is just a small part of your compensation. We talked about this uh, uh, many times uh, with the police, for example, not specifically, just to be clear, for example, as a rough, you know. (laughs) Um, But, you know, you're making six, eight, ten thousand baht a month. Yeah, their salary is low, their education is low. So So they supplement. And you're expected to jump in front of bullets when 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 yeah. things go and nuts. This like, is a long-standing tradition mm-hmm. that comes out of the Saktina officials were not paid. Right. Yep. You know they were given power, yeah. and then they had to use that power to earn. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, back in um, ancient Rome, collecting taxes. The government didn't collect taxes. The uh, these businesses would get together and they would bid to win the right to collect taxes. So mm-hmm. they paid X amount of money, and then they would be the ones responsible for going out and getting taxes. And if they were able to get more than they paid, then they win. It was and that right. system, almost exactly like that, was used in Thailand. Yeah. Right. It's called tax farming. Oh. And there would be uh, people who would bid on the right to a certain kind of tax, oh, the opium wow. tax or the land tax or the harbor tax in a particular area for a set amount. And whoever had the highest bid w- w- would get the right to collect taxes for a year or two years. Oh, interesting. And often that was the route that the Chinese took to become banks and financiers. They started out as tax farmers. In fact, I think uh, Taksin's ancestors were tax farmers. Wow. So, I mean, it's a bit of a tangent, but do you, do, do the two of you, having been here a long time and studied Thai history, do you think corruption is going down? <laughs> No, you, you don't. You, My you, personal experience is getting worse. I have a different take on this. Okay. I would say that decentralizing corruption is an improvement. <laughs> First <laughs> it's of still all, corruption, but you, you widen the number of people who, who can, can get wealthy. 
Second of all, they're closer to the local communities. So, uh, yeah, they, they may take some percent off the top, but they know they have to still deliver something or people will, will That's vote, vote them out. For them. That's fascinating. So, like, they there's a... For them. The good side. Uh, there's good corruption and bad corruption. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let me let me ask you something out here about um, something that personally I'm very interested in, which is uh, uh, satire and sarcasm, uh, <laughs> as speaking truth to power. In the book, you talk about uh, Sam Samanan, an artist who drew what we today call political cartoons, and the quote from the book is. While such cartoons, by their nature, could not provide substantive analysis of the ills of the country, they were important because they showed the population a radically different view of the elite and the traditional ruling system. Although created by, uh, by educated urban middle class radicals, these cartoons were undoubtedly motivated and informed by the active resentment of the rural poor aroused by the privileges and wealth of urban capitalists and royal officials. Because the cartoons reach to a broader, semi-literate audience, they play a, a role in preparing the ground for the overthrow of that system in 1932. So I'm fascinated by the role that, that sarcasm and, and parody and satire play in, in speaking truth to power. As someone who was bullied terribly growing up, I learned to use humor and sarcasm to make fun of people. And I always thought it was interesting because there's only two responses to that. You can either out sarcasm them or you can beat them into the ground. You can't really do anything else. Well, actually, there was another. All right, let me know. Uh, and this was something that the um, royal government took in the 1920s, which was to buy the newspapers that were printing these. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> right. I wish someone would have paid yeah. me off when I was getting my, my ass kicked <laughs> in grade eight. Well, they, they did some buying and they did some imprisoning. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but the colonial um, aspect of... Thailand in the 1920s, Siam in the 1920s, was that the major colonial powers, France, Germany, uh, England, all had extraterritorial rights. So you, the Thai courts could not, by themselves, prosecute foreigners. And Thais are clever. Uh, when they started a newspaper, they would make sure that the majority owner was a foreigner. Oh, I see. And, and <laughs> I uh, therefore, their newspaper could not be closed down. This was of great frustration uh, to the royal government. And that's why those sarcastic cartoons were able to see the light of day. Interesting. And I think some of them would not be permitted today. Right. They were so biting, so... Uh, sarcastic yeah. uh, and aimed high right. up in sure. what was then the royal government that they wouldn't that, uh, no newspaper in Thailand today would print them right right but, but political satire still plays a role in 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 modern Thai politics yeah. just a little more careful gotcha yeah, yeah that, that, that is in the Hong Kong post I saw it all the time and we use it in on English, this show too where English the, language the, the, yeah because, we, I mean we're we're an English language podcast so that provides us a little bit of insulation and not like we ever talk about anything really terrible but you know there are idioms and ways to talk about things and uh, allusions <laughs> and things like that right. that that you get if you understand but if you're if you're not within that system you might not understand i'm just really interested in in, in this in thailand because it doesn't seem like a a culture where the elites to use a, a phrase they would not appreciate someone using humor they don't understand to poke fun at them uh, I don't think Thailand's unique in that regard either, but it just seems they're particularly prickly about it here. You cannot. I, that's the end fun. of my story. I don't really have a point you there. Like, like not, not like in America. I think when someone uh, make jokes about the president, right, he will be very happy because he will laugh. It, yeah. yeah, he will laugh. I will laugh because it's, whether it's true or not, but it means that people interested in him is a PR for them. Right? <laughs> oh, right, right, so right, you look right. at that way, but in Thailand, no way. But even right, if right. they didn't laugh about it. You cannot make joke of it, any politician right, or right. any head of state or your boss or anything, no way. Right. Uh, Paul they just, take it too serious. Paul just showed me uh, a page from Radical Thought Thai Mind, and this is a cartoon um, in the May 9th, 1926 edition of Krot Lek Sem portrayed the dynastic state as a monkey perched precariously on a chariot hitched to a team of withering lizards. Hia, traditionally held to be loathsome creatures. Yeah, so... Not sure you could publish that today. No, no yeah. way. <laughs> That's a funny cartoon. <laughs> and uh, actually, um, uh, an Australian academic did a whole PhD thesis on 
Thai political cartoons, and there's cartoon after cartoon that are in that along that line. Uh, so it must have had an effect. Sure, sure. So coming back around to recent history, another quote in the book, if I may. Um, Raising a theme that was to become a long-standing issue in Thai political conflict, the People's Party accused the royal government of believing, quote, the people could not have any voice in politics because they were stupid, unquote. The announcement said uh, royalty feared it would lose power if the people became educated enough to see how they were exploited by the ruling class. And it reminds me of a quote by my, my personal hero, George Carlin, who said that governments don't want an educated populace. They want people just smart enough to work the machines but just dumb enough to not know how badly they're getting screwed over by by the ruling class. Um, at, again, Thailand is not unique in that regard. But do you think do you think that's changing? Do you think that, um, like we talked about earlier, the access to information, the more educated populace? What's going to happen? What's the trajectory of that? I think this is one of those lines in the sand that keeps moving. <laughs> you right. know, when are people educated enough? Right. Uh, you've got uh, something in the Thai constitution now that requires people in parliament free, to have uh, uh, a degree. Yeah. And that's controversial, but it's the law. And that's another example of this. But maybe in the future, people will have to have master's degrees or PhDs. Right. And... Uh, even if they do, then they'll be dismissed. Well, they're eggheads, uh, you know. So uh, I don't think it's any more a real objection, but it is there that people are stupid. They'll believe a tuxin. They'll believe a radical rabble rouser. Uh, they need to be controlled from above. But I think that just from Emma students, and I got a government scholarship to study PhD, you know, 10 million baht. And I think the Sakrina system, now they are changing their minds. I think they think that educated people can think for themselves. So they have a lot of scholarships to send people like us to study abroad, to expose to the, the Western culture and come back and think because they know that they cannot stop People from education, people can seek education somewhere else. And why not they be, are the one who will show their kindness? So I'm very grateful to my government sure. that sent me to study there. I have the scholarship since, you know, bachelor degree through PhDs and it's for free. It's great. So they're it's starting great. to see the benefits that yeah, you can bring to Thailand yeah. because you're not exposed only, to this. But thing. they are emphasized on the scientific more yes, than the social I, science. I think this is scientific, a good point. Scientific. Because they to want come back who, and develop and King Rama... The sixth, the fifth, the sixth really sent his children abroad. To they get did, some, but I think to come back after and develop 1932, oh. the emphasis shifted from things like politics and philosophy yeah, to, and to science, science. And <laughs> to things how to operate these farang machines, yeah. <laughs> right. how, how to, to provide better medical science, care, yeah. things that were technological and clearly beneficial to whoever had power, but not so much emphasis on those who might come up with ideas that would change whose hands were on the levers of power. But they know that if these students go outside of Thailand, they will be exposed to democracy, to liberal, you know, liberalism, to freedom. They cannot avoid it. They want to live in an environment like that. They would be they would see things in their own eyes, even though they have the professional degree in computer science or medical school, they are exposed to those environments. And of course, they would mm. compare when they come home, right? Sure. So a lot of radical students, they are not the, the mm. program scientists. Right. They are medical students. They are engineers. Most of them are the engineers, in fact, right? Well, uh, I've got a, I, th or that, I think that's a good segue into a question I think we asked Chris Baker. Um, so in, in, in my classes, I talk about the, the vicious cycle of Thai politics, which mm -hmm. we've seen this cycle over and over again. Mm -hmm. And once again, in the last five years, we have a new round of protest, y even younger Thais. So my question to you, um, as two experts on Thai society, is this uh, just going to be another cycle where, you know, so maybe we'll get some reform, and then maybe in 2028, there'll be another coup, and it's just going to keep going? Or do you think uh, this young generation can we break out of this cycle? Can, can Is there something different now that's happening? 
Are you optimistic? I think I am pretty optimistic. You are because I just look at the constitution. Okay, it's been changing. Uh, whoever in power, the first thing they do is change the constitution. Sure. So now the change can happen if that person who is in power, hopefully being elected, can change the constitution into the better one. You know that the first constitution allow the senator for to be elect, uh, selected because the Thai people are un- uneducated. They say that not till the Thai people are educated, then you can have election for the senator, you know, for the senator. But the, the, low, low, the lower house is, at that time the Thai people don't have even primary for education. Hmm. So they said, you can, at least you have to have primary education to be, to, you can elect your own representative. But the current constitution, see, changing into, you have to have a degree, bachelor degree at least to be the MP, right? Right. And senator at least a master's degree, something like that. So it's changing, evolving by nature. As I mentioned before, that the Thai people are very practical. So they are evolving all the system to be to survive into the world. Now, not only the country, the world. Right. Okay, well, in some ways, I would say Thailand has gotten better in certain some ways. But politically, we are in this cycle that seems to repeat where we have these periods of revolution, like in the 70s or in the 90s. And, and it's like, and you, you feel like, okay, we're on this path to being a real democracy. And then yeah. there's, a, there's instability or a coup and we seem to be okay. Because now I, I feel like roughly now we're kind of back to the 80s. You know, with kind of a managed, semi-democratic Actually, there are system. a lot of parallels with the 1970s. Okay. Prior to the October 14th, because you had military leaders who decided that uh, they would have elections, but they wanted to control the results sure. of those right. elections. Right. Uh, and they had uh, a parliament that was rather difficult to control. Sure. And then people had their hands out, wanted money, wanted power. So it was difficult for these military leaders to control the system, and therefore they had a coup, and that sparked the uprising on October 14th, So, Paul, would you say, you, so are you optimistic as well about the current generation? I, I think there's certain reasons for optimism, but there's a whole lot of inertia from the past, from that Satina system, right. from the self-interests of those in power, um, one of the things that's concerning is the way uh, laws have been used uh, to suppress uh, opposition. Um, so so uh, I don't think we're young enough to see <laughs> things come out uh, the way we'd like. Um, but the, I, I also think that at least we've seen a reduction in the amount of violence, uh, certainly going back to um, Black May, uh, there was uh, violence. Uh, there were there was violence uh, when the red shirts came into Bangkok. I think that scale of political violence, at least I certainly hope so, is a matter of the past, and that. It's been shown that both sides lose right. when, when that kind of violence happens, and certainly society loses, as well as lives being lost. Sure. So I, I hope that lesson has been learned, and I sense that both sides have moderated a little bit the demands uh, of the, say, mid-1970s for a republic, uh, uh, socialist... Uh, complete change in the way things done, uh, that's no longer the demand. Right, uh, right. The radicalism of the 70s is more radical than anything we see today. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So the, the, and the protesters have learned something or they've gotten more yeah, reasonable yeah, yeah. to a and certain extent. The question is whether the, the uh, reactionaries have <laughs> right, right. <laughs> equally Whether moderated. they've gotten more reasonable, right. Whether. No, I, I am very optimistic about Thai politics. Is because I look at the economic issue, economic situation in Thailand. 
every time we have the coup is when Thailand faced a very serious economic problems. In 1970s, a lot of people were unemployed. The new grads they have nothing else to do, so they march on the street, they rebel against the government, they blame on the, the three tyrants, you know, the three generals who don't give them jobs. So every time we have this change, it's because of economic problem. But look around now. I think the Thai people, even in the village, have lived better, hmm. better off than in the past. Right? The rice cost is okay. The cost of the rubber is okay. People live better. Every house, they have a pickup truck to drive. They have the road to go. That is the symbol that they are, have the better life. Right. And I don't... And every time they change the government, they learn that the main, the key thing to keep them in power is to develop economy so that Thai live happily without, without the, uh, the opponent. I think that and that's why I'm very optimistic. I mean, every single family now I went to visit in the villages, they live better. They have cars, have motorcycles. And you think that will lead to political demands uh, of, let's say, of real democracy, you think? So once they have this economic security, you think that will lead to a, a, a more democratic system? I think the idea of democracy for Thai people are very weak. Hmm. They are very weak. That's why they claim that this is Thai democracy. So as long as they live well... They don't know, have time to pick up pitchforks. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they live well. Every government is okay. I ask these people on the street. I don't care who is the politician, who is the ruler, as long as they live well enough to live on and become richer. See. So that's to me that sounds like economic optimism, but I'm not sure I would call that political optimism. But it's related. You can't separate these two. Is the same thing. I'm a Marxist. I mean, Marxist theorist. So I trying to quote Marxism that. The you know idea of society is when people are equal economically, economically, but not to that extreme. But if they live well enough, mm -hmm. it's, it's natural. When you are you have a right to eat, you have a need. Why you care about who is going to be the ruler? Right? When you have enough to eat, you don't. And you see the differences. In the past, I cannot own the land. I cannot have the house. I have to rent it now. I, I own the house. Sure. So so that's that's the is is the interaction between political and economic right, you know, situation. Right. But we've also seen that often it is the wealthier people, the middle class, uh, who lead opposition movements. Sure, certainly and in who, the 90s, certainly. Yeah, yeah I mean, even today. If you look at the Move Forward Party, who are the leaders? Sure. Uh, Taksin. Right. Um, whether you consider him uh, a radical or a reactionary, <laughs> I'm not sure. But uh, he certainly was well enough off. Uh, so, and personal power may have been a, a large part sure. of his motivation. But, I, but, uh, I feel, you know, what, but people do want, want to, to have a say in how they're governed. Right. You know, when I talk to my students about this, um, I, I don't know, I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I see kind of both sides. Well, one reason I'm a bit of a pessimist is that I feel, I feel that I don't see the power of the Thai military reducing in any way, or I don't see them expressing a desire to limit themselves. And I think that uh, even though there's like a new generation of protesters, I feel for the Thai military, this is the same old thing. They have a playbook. They know how to handle this ever since the 70s. You know, you know, they, uh, you know, th there was a, a photo uh, in, this is in the, uh, during the red shirt uh, things. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this photo, but it was uh, the military showing all these weapons of the, uh, of the red shirts, these guns that they had, right? And then some some reporter figured out that they were reusing a photo from the, the mm -hmm. from from the seventies. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. the same photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a table with grenades and stuff. Right, and then someone right. found out this was an old photo from the communists that they captured. Yeah. So to me, I think for the Thai military, this is the same old thing. They're used to the, every generation is going to protest, and the Thai military is totally used to this. There, there's a playbook. Yeah, that they have a playbook. They have. Um, there was a point, I think. Um, in the immediate aftermath of uh, uh, Prime Minister Anand Panyarachun, where a new constitution came in. 97, sure. And the leaders of the military seemed to be content. To They, they had their, their goodies and they had but their chunk of power, proved. but they were not supreme. And that was overturned, unfortunately, in, and this is part of the sad legacy of Taksin Shinovat, because he became so polarizing that uh, that 
willingness of the militaries to step back uh, was overturned. Right. And they stepped forward again. And you're right. I'm not sure they're going to step back again. Yeah. Let, I agree with you totally that the, the, the military still has a lot of power to control the country. But then you ask the next question, why? Why is that Thai society, people, love the military even now? They love Prayut. They want Prayut to stay in power. Why? Because the Thai people look at the idea of society is the society that is peace, peaceful. Mm, right. right. Peace would got to be in order to live normal life. There's no fighting against each other, no conflict. Not that you have a personal right. Not that you are given the right to speak up. No. Understood. You cannot speak up because it leads to, leads to conflict. Disturb, disturb the peacefulness of the society, right? So that legitimate the military to become in power even stronger when any conflict exists. The Thai people, like I said, they don't understand the meaning of democracy. The democracy is the tool for people to use to confront each other peacefully. But they think democracy means that if the government is bad, we can come and protest again and be angry and cause conflict. conflict. Yeah, interesting. So the interesting, has, right? has the legit- legitimacy to come back because the Thai people don't know don't know how to use democracy as a tool to create the society that is peaceful. See, they, they, they are very tyrant, very hot tempered. They want <laughs> things to happen fast. Think about it: how many years democracy has evolved in America, in Canada, or right. in Britain? How many right. years has it been involved to long become time. now? Very long but time. But Thailand, 1932. How many years? Well, it's about 90, 90 years. 90 years. But, yeah, yeah, but still not but, enough because the and Thailand, most of those 90 years have yeah, not um, been under. That's democracy. right. No. That's right. See, right. of course. So you then need time to. For me, if I have the leader, if I were the leader of society, I will educate them what democracy is. You get them about rights from the, the method of socialization, from the family basis. I live in American family. I could see differences between democratic family and and and, and you know authoritarian family <laughs> in my country. You know, it's completely different. So the idea of democracy hasn't been instilled into Thai cultures from the family. To school, to workplace, to government, to also oh, it's, right. it's that, time. It takes time. It takes and that's, time. that's something we've said on the show before too. Like yeah. you say, why you know it's easy for foreigners to come in and say, why can't Thailand just yeah. sort its stuff out? We're like, well, you've had democracy in the U.S. for two hundred yeah. X yeah. years. Well, we also had Greece and Rome a couple thousand yeah. years ago too. So we have a long, long history. Right. Yeah. We're, we're not even a century a king here yet. In America, right? I'd like to ask you a questions. After all the interviews about Thai cultures and everything, what do you think that our country is going to lead to in the future? Would we be <laughs> comparable to the very civilized society? Or where are we now in terms of comparison to other countries? I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. I'm not the smart one between me and Ed. So. <laughs> Ed that is not think? true. You know that is not true. No, it's not true. Uh, uh, that is not true. Well, economically, I think Thailand is doing quite well. And we, we actually, I ha- we had our PhD economist on the show, and I asked him, uh, is Thailand a poor country? And he said, not even close. Uh, you know, he's, he spent a lot of time in Africa, see, and see. he said, Thailand is way ahead. I mean, even, even just GDP-wise, mm-hmm. Thailand's almost in the top 10% in the world. Top twelve percent. I mean, so he he just said Thailand is nowhere. It's not even close to being a poor country in terms of people who do development. He's a development economist, um, and then. Uh, but my my field is is politics. So I, I, in a way, I might be a little bit similar to you in that economically, I do think things are getting better. And I, but but to me, the, the, I think the military has learned your lesson that if they can get growth and and stability then maybe Thai people won't push as hard for a real democracy. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm, I'm in the long run I think Thailand will sort itself out and 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 you know for all the reasons we talked about educated young people access to social media you know seeing things better having you know seeing other countries with political freedom but I think it's going to take a while to get to get like quote-unquote real democracy. I think that's going to take a while. We, we always say Thailand is a country of baby steps. 
And I think it's just a, ser- exactly. a series of baby and steps. And you know why? Because it's like the system. In my mind, deep in my mind, I said we will never be a real democracy, not Western, the real authentic democracy, because of Sakrina system. Sakrina meaning that a hierarchical. This hierarchy, Everyone right? Everyone has its place. Even now, my man is lower than me. He cannot argue with me. My sure. children is lower. He cannot argue with the parents. You know, even now, so it's very strong. I remember in a in strong an, system, very I was strong shocked. culture. You know, t- toxin is seen as. Westernized in many ways, but uh, he he was interviewed by a journalist when he was in Dubai, and the journalist asked him, "Was there anyone in your inner circle who could disagree with you?" And he said, "Only my wife." So I mean, and I was like, "Oh my God!" Like he's the prime minister, so he has no one telling him he's making a mistake. No, no one's allowed. To, and I, I was like, "Oh my God!" I thought because yeah, I think of him as Westernized. He went to school in the states. He supposedly had American advisors, but he said in his whole government, no one would disagree with him except his wife. Not- That's the fatal flaw the, of authoritarianism yeah. all over the world. Yeah, uh, whether it comes from personality or it comes from history, uh, once you risen to a certain point you don't listen to anyone else no and no one else but he's supposed to dares. You know, he was supposed to be and <laughs> but he was elected twice he's supposed to represent democracy but i think thai culture was was and no. was still authoritarian yeah yes. he was an elected authoritarian <laughs> they, they feel good and, and we see that today yeah well, and sure, you think about course. it the thai people have been absolute monarchies for how many years right for a thousand or more yep. yeah. and suddenly you have a Non, non uh, king, uh, ruler. Right. So they accept the idea that okay, if your government, your, your your job is to provide, provide welfare to the people, and they don't care about personal rights. I mean, they, this and people's alien, job is to be loyal. To be sure. loyal. Sure. That idea still orders. carry on to now. Not when not only toxin, that no one can argue. Nobody can attack. Can argue with the. The boss, right, especially right. the bureaucracy. I went to the meeting. I was working with. I worked with the UNICEF for the meeting and everything. Once the question raised there, or the head of the department said something, nobody opened their mouth to argue anything. I was the only one <laughs> because I wasn't there. They're, they're inferior, you see. I'm from outside. I'm the donor to the to them to come to them. So I'm. I have the right to argue with them. Right. So nobody ever argue against their bosses. Otherwise, they will be this position. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> it's right. This is system still there. Yeah, you're right. So Interesting. It's very, so for me, it's very sad. Interesting. Because I, I, I am very democracy. My children argue with me, Paul, and argue with me. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially you s- me. since I'm younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not, you're not supposed to do And that. I'm the youngest <laughs> daughter, youngest child in my family. I could not argue with my sister no matter what. No oh, matter I, I have a PhD, I have experience to live in all over the, the world, or no matter I, uh, I'm richer, I have a better husband, I cannot still argue with them. You are the them. Nong, right? <laughs> argue with them, they feel sad and they feel like... Right. Well, how dare you? How right. dare you? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, Paul and Yung Rat, thank you so much for, for, for chatting. It was super, super interesting. Um, I mean, that could have split off into 10 more episodes of podcasts sure. talking about a bunch of different stuff. Anytime. So let's book you up for the rest of the year. All right. Definitely. We'll come back. We'll do a part two and a part three and a part four. <laughs> Radical Thought, Thai Mind. It's a very, very cool book. It gives you a really good insight into uh, into a part of Thai culture that maybe uh, most people might not know, as well as Beads on a String, uh, your first in a series of novels that will eventually be turned into movies directed by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the but, next one will be be titled Dark Karma. Yep. Dark Karma. Part two of Beast on the String. Describe, I like it. Describes I like my it. life. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure meeting you, and thank you for coming coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you. you are thank you, guys. Well, it's fun talking to you. Wow. As I said last week, I, I loved this uh, uh, interview uh, discussion. Um for me, it's fascinating the 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 kind of story of the 1932 revolution and how it came about and and kind of the justification for it is such a fascinating story. You know, when I when I first read about it, I was thinking, you know, only in Thailand could you have a revolution, quote unquote, that ends, uh, you know, what a 700 year absolute monarchy, right? 
and basically it was bloodless. Mm. I think I think maybe technically one person died or something, but it, it's it's such a in a way it's a very Thai story in that you get uh, the monarch at the time basically agrees. You know, so it's like you know this is a revolution and they seize the palace and they're going to overthrow absolute monarchy and institute democracy. And then uh, the monarch at the time, you know, writes a letter and says, "Hey, sounds good. Like let <laughs> yeah, like let like let's work together on this." Like yeah, it was very like to me it was like, wait, this is so Thai. Like thousands of people are supposed to die like when this shit happens. You know, yeah, well, you know that's that's funny, and that's how I, I I always phrase it whenever there's a coup. And I know it's funny saying that, but you know I've lived through two coups in Thailand now, and that's uh, that's sort of how you show you the, your the tree rings of your of that, your life. That's right. That is correct. Thailand, right. That is so, correct. I've got two as you. I've got two just like you do. Right. We should get little shoulder epaulets that we put on our. <laughs> for every coup but like you know when we when we grow up we hear things we hear the word coup and it's always in school and it's always followed by words like bloodshed and violence and conflict thousands and stuff. thousands of deaths right sure yeah so when i lived through my first coup in thailand it was really eye opening but yeah these these guys paul paul and young route just so so interesting and so fascinating and they really have read deeply on the subject i mean imagine spending the hours in the libraries that they have going through these old dusty books describing things from poets way back hundreds of years ago. You no, know? you know, their knowledge of Thai history is is great. And, you know, for me, it's fascinating because, um, you know, one of, the, one of the leaders of the revolution is Pretty Banam Yong, mm. a very famous Thai person and the founder of my university. And um, it's fascinating because he's part of this story of radical thought in Thailand. Right. Because when, uh, you know, when Thailand made this transition or tried to make the transition, they kind of had a blank slate uh, which doesn't happen very often in history. It, 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 normally, countries like change very gradually, but in this case, you have a so-called revolution, and then you have the monarch agreeing to share power, and it's like, okay, let's sit down and let's write a constitution, you know, a democratic one that's something Thailand has never had. Right. And so they they kind of could kind of do whatever they wanted, and then you ended up with Pretty Bonham Young, who, who more or less he was he definitely wasn't what I would call a communist, but he was pretty far left. And, he, you know, he, the original, like his original ideas were things like every Thai person should be guaranteed a job, mm -hmm. stuff like that, which is, which is pretty far left, which is like kind of like socialist kind of stuff. Right. I mean, right. FDR in the U.S. basically wanted the same thing, like a workers' bill of rights that never, never took hold in the States. But, you know, pretty bottom young was in that school. But the, the ir irony of that is that his kind of far left um, economics, it gave ammunition to people who were opposed to the democratic revolution. So right. it's like, so, so, so he was kind of branded a communist, even though he wasn't. Um, mm. and, 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 you know, communists, like true communists are, are definitely anti-monarchy. So this is like, this is the fascinating, the fascinating way political ideology works. Like if, if, if you get too far left, then people can kind of use that against you and say you're like an anti-royalist and stuff. And uh, we, right. you know, we can't we can't talk about it in too much detail on the show. But if you read history books, eventually, Pretty Bonham Young had to leave Thailand due to due to controversy and sure. and never and never was able to return. But the the way it interweaves the 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 way that a Paul and Yongrat can interweave the story of how radical thought where it came from because I didn't really know that like I didn't know the class divisions. I didn't the know Sakdina about the system and things yeah, like I didn't that. Know, yeah, I didn't know about the Sakdina system and then how it, how it fed into the revolution. Because in 1932, actually what they were doing was radical. Yeah. That, was, that was radical. Um, e even though like as a Westerner or an American or a Canadian, we're like, oh yeah, of course you want to be a democracy. That's not radical. That's like normal. That's like mainstream. But not, <laughs> not you know, but not in, not in, in Siamese history. Exactly. You know, that, that's a very radical thing. You know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting talking to them was how much a personalities could sway things or tip the scales in one direction or the other. You know, like I, I didn't know that Preeti and Black like, Pibun Song Kram were so close and had come out of the same sort of gang of youths. Uh, That's right. Come, come up together. And it was really interesting to me that just like one thing could have changed or one story would have happened differently and history would have been very, very different. But it was just sort of a became a bit of a power struggle and Thailand zigged instead of zagged. I thought that was fascinating. 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, you and I, this podcast, we're, we're big, I would say, fans of the P. Boon Song Kram story. Um, mm. You know, his, you know we, we've, we've done a history episode on him. Maybe we need to do a history episode on, on, on Pretty Bonham Young. He's, he's not as um, kind of flashy or, um, you know, I, I think Plak P. Boon Song Kram, he's interesting because he's just kind of weird. Like, he's just like a weird, like, like you know, again, you and I are kind of fascinated with him, like, and his story. Mm. Um um, so people, uh, so, so pretty is not like kind of as weird, but he's still like this guy who obviously changed Thai history and everything, but you're right. It's like, they went from being friends who were both like pro revolution and then having a falling out where, and then, um, you know, people ends up becoming like a military dictator, you know, yeah. the opposite of like, like a democratic leader. Um, yeah. So listeners out there, uh, you should listen to our history episodes, or if you got some free time, you you might want to read about uh, like the 1930s in Thailand. It's fascinating. Mm. Like, like just the, like as you pointed out, like it could have just gone in so many different directions, and with you know World War II impending in Thailand. Sure, yeah. Like like you, you don't you know as as an American, I w- I just wouldn't think of Thailand as being in the middle of World War II, but it was because the British were in India and Burma, and yes, Malaysia, that's right. and Malaysia. You know, so so like the like Thailand was like a front in the war, and as the Japanese went out to meet uh, the British, Siam later Thailand was just caught in the middle, and um, it's it's just a fascinating story. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, thanks, Paul and Yongrat for coming on. It was it was a real pleasure sitting down and chatting. And um, Ed, I, I chatted with them on email quickly today, and uh, they'll they'll come back on again to talk about their next book series. Uh, the first one is out already called Beads on a String, which is more of a narrative, but also based a lot around uh, the history in Southern Thailand and things like that. It sounds like a really fascinating story. So we'll cool. get them on again. We'll have a great chat. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, I would love that. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Paul and Yongrat. All right, let's get into some Love, Loathe, or Live With, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss to decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. Now, last week I asked Ed if he would rather be caught uh, like a spider in the Thai legal system or the Western legal system. So this week, Ed, it's all about you. I got uh, a, a pretty specific one for you. Right. Now, I think on, on previous shows, you you and I have waxed philosophically about Thai condiments, not I condom think so. machines. Yeah, we've, we've... Not, not condom machines like we talked about in, <laughs> on the bonus show. But uh, we've talked about the, the kind of tray of sugar and chili and sure, different yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask you about, um, to be honest, uh, after 20 years, I don't even know what it's called in Thai. But there is a usually kind of a straight up chili sauce. But in addition to that, there's typically um, kind of chilies floating in kind of like a weak vinegar. Um, mm. So whatever that is called, chilies in vinegar, that thing, whatever that is called. All right, that specific one. What's your take? I think you're talking about Nam Som Prick Dong. Damn, you you actually know what it's called? Well, I know what it is because I love it. That's a oh, really? hard, hard love for me. Yeah. In fact, I love it. I love it so much that I put it on. I put way too much of it in my food. And my wife like gets angry, like really angry at me for ruining the food that she just paid for. Oh, but. funny. <laughs> oh, oh, this this is rare because we rarely have a joint love because I love it as well. And now, And one of the reasons I love it is that it's actually not super spicy and it's not super vinegary. Like, I don't know what it is. But like if when I when I have stuff like balsamic or um, like especially stuff like apple cider vinegar, you got to go easy with that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you can't you can't like drench a salad in like apple cider vinegar. Like no way. Like no, you got to no, this... go you got to go easy. But this this is perfect. It's like it's kind of like it's it is vinegar, but it's just not as harsh. It's not as biting. Yeah, um, it's weird. The, the chilies take the edge off the vinegar, and the vinegar takes the spiciness out of the chilies. Yeah, whatever it is, uh, it's my favorite of the Thai. Like when they give you the condiment thing, which usually got either four or six options. Mm-hmm. Some some are like, uh, uh, you know, like sugar and spice, and then there's like liquids. But of the of the condiment options, it's definitely my favorite. Second only to the ten thousand pink napkins that are stuffed into the <laughs> into the right. thing. But yeah, I, I'm a hard love on this stuff. I put it. I, I can't think of a dish it's not good on. Like it's rice dish, noodle dish, whatever. Little Agreed. bit is just adds a nice little 
to it. Yeah. Agree 100%. Hard love from me as well. A rare joint hard love. That sounds a little <laughs> bit, that sounds a little bit weird, but we're just going to go, I'm, I'm just going to go with that. Okay. A joint hard love. I love it. <laughs> All right. A final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping in our never ending quest for cool content. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcasts on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Totes my goats. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website to we'll a feature on the show. I dump Twitter, but you can now find me on Mastodon at bkkgreg at home.social. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take it easy out there. We'll see you back here next week. No doubt.